this morning we're going to continue in our series, Foundations of the Faith. Uh, we've been thinking about some of the big building blocks of the Christian faith and exploring them together. Some of these familiar truths. I know I found it helpful as I've sat and listened, as I've been preparing uh, for some of these, uh, to, to think these things through again, to be reminded of some of the wonderful truths of Christianity. And today we come to the theme of guidance. I think this is a really important theme for us to think about. Uh, sometimes uh, when I prepare sermons, I, I end up over at Cafe Nero, just uh, in Castle Point, in the back of Waterstones. It's quite a, a good place to, to think and to read and to write and stuff. And um, as I'm coming out, quite often I'll just have a little peruse of the books to see if there's anything there that people are writing that has to do with the theme that we're talking about on whatever Sunday it is. And normally there's one or two titles that, uh, that fit with, with what I'm saying, maybe a different perspective, um, helpful to look at. Uh, but this week, as, we were thinking about, as I was thinking about guidance, I came across just an, an avalanche of literature. If you, if you go into Waterstones and look for books that are offering guidance on one topic or another, you will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, won't you? And I think it reflects the fact that we are desperate for guidance. We want someone who's been there before or someone who's made a success or someone who's got some wisdom or some inside track to tell us what to do. And so there are books on having a startup company, books on how to progress your career, books on how to develop your relationships or build lasting friendships, books on um, well-being and mindfulness, books on um, how to have um, the right relationship or pick the right life partner, books on how to pass your exams, books on almost anything you could imagine, books on the right diet, books on uh, all sorts of things. And so uh, there's just this, this huge volume of literature, people saying, do this, do that, do the other, do this. And it's not just in our literature that we um, see our, our desire for guidance reflected. If you look at almost any film, you'll see in our cinematography that we are desperate for guidance. Um, think of the hero in almost any story, and at some point, a guide will come alongside them and help them to kind of reach the goal they're going for. It will be a Gandalf, or a Yoda, or a Rafiki, if you know that one, uh, or Dumbledore, or Mr. Miyagi, a good 80s character there. Uh, but, but there's always a guide who pops up, and they help the hero to, to reach the goal they're going for. And so whether it's books, or films, or TV, or vlogs, or whatever it is, people are, are looking for guidance. They're looking for someone to point them in the right direction. And Christians are no different. I think we're just like any other person, that we recognize that we're kind of um, out of our depth a lot of the time. We're looking for somebody to help us along the way. The difference is, of course, that as Christians, we believe in an all-powerful, sovereign, eternally wise Father God. We've been thinking about him over the last few weeks and exploring what that might mean. And so for us as Christians, it's very different, isn't it? naturally we want to hear from him naturally we want to be guided by him we want him to direct our path and yet yeah, i think for a lot of christians this theme of guidance can be quite unsettling um, it can lead to a fair bit of anxiety uh, not because we doubt god his sovereignty his 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 wisdom his plan for our life but i think often we wonder whether we're on that track we're nervous that we might have missed the turning or that we've missed God's best for us. We're worried that we're not hearing him quite right and that we are just kind of floundering around in the dark when we want to be hearing and following our God. And so it's good that we think about this together this morning. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to dive straight in. And hopefully we'll cover a fair bit of ground this morning, but it, I'm praying will be helpful for you. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you are the kind of God that I've just described, that you are a God who is eternally wise, a God who knows the beginning from the end, a God who loves us like a father. And so, Father, as we come to look at this theme of guidance, please um, help us. Please open our eyes and help us to take steps of faith to follow you this week, we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, I guess the opening question is, how do we do it? How do we, as the passage we read in Romans said, how do we live as people who are led by the Spirit of God? How can we be like that? How can we hear his voice? Well, the question we want to start with is, how does he guide us? And the answer which I'm going to give you is kind of a stating the obvious sort of answer. God guides us primarily and most clearly through the Bible. You can look at that famous text. Lots of you will be familiar with that in 2 Timothy 3. It says that Scripture is God-breathed, all of it. 
And it's all useful for all kinds of things, for teaching us, for rebuking us, that's kind of turning us back when we go the wrong way, for training us in righteousness. The place where God speaks to us more clearly than anywhere else is in the Bible. I mean, look down your lap or open up your phone, and and a lot of you here will have a Bible that you can look at. And it's no coincidence that we're in the evening service looking at Psalm 119. So if you haven't been coming along in the evenings, maybe catch up on, on YouTube at those, of those sermons. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. And the constant theme throughout is the Word of God. I think next week in the reading we've got, we'll hear these words. Your Word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. As, as we na- navigate our way through the, the darkness and the confusion of this world... More than anything else, we hear the word of God speaking to us, illuminating the path ahead of us. And so what does that mean for us? Well, if the word of God, if this book is not just a bunch of human authors speaking to us, it's not just Luke and Isaiah and Matthew and Moses and Paul, but as well as that, it is the very words of God to us. And what should we do? Well, Read it. (laughs) It It's kind of obvious, isn't it? It, If we want to hear God speaking to us, if we want God to guide us, then the the simplest thing you can do is to read the Word of God, to to listen to Him, to to make time for it, to make space for it. Some of you here are on summer holidays now. You have an entire month off from school, or more than that, six weeks off from school. If you go to private school, eight weeks off from school, maybe more if you're somewhere else. You have a lot of time on your hands. You will never have an opportunity like that again in your life. Make use of that time. Read it every day. Carve out a bit of time and and read this book. Listen to God speaking to you. Hear his words. Hear him speak. And for all of us, I mean, you may feel busy. You might not have a six-week block of time on your hands where you've got nothing else to do apart from whatever you fancy. But still, never use the excuse, I'm too busy, full stop. I, I just don't buy it. I, I know from my own experience that I'm never too busy, full stop. I'm, I'm too busy for some things, but I always make time for the things that matter to me. For you, you might always make time to, to cook a nice meal. You might always make time to go to the gym. You might always make time to sit and binge on Netflix for four and a half hours in a row. You, you, you make time for stuff that matters. Um, and we can all make time for the things that matter to us, even in, in busy lives. And so if when you heard this morning Andy saying that the the sermon was going to be about guidance, and you thought, yeah, I I would love to hear God guiding me. I'd love to hear more clearly the voice of God in my life. Then make time for this book. Read it every day. If, if If you agreed with me when I said that it's the word of God, then just think about that for a few moments. What should that do to the way that I approach this book? It's not just another how-to manual from Waterstones, but this is the infinitely wise, sovereign God of the universe in print, talking to me as I read it. Read it as much as you can. Talk to people about it. Join a small group. Buy books from Keith Jones that help you to understand it better. Find good resources online. Memorize it. This, this is actually something which I've only, it's only dawned on me like in the last month, maybe month and a half, that memorizing the Bible is really, really helpful. I, I missed out on, it may sound really stupid, but I, I missed out on, on Sunday school because I became a Christian a bit later on in life. And usually it's sort of under the age of 10 when people do all their Bible memorizing, isn't it? And then we get to be grown-ups and we sort of forget that it's a useful thing to do. And so no one really suggested I did it um, growing up. And just recently, I've started to try and memorize sections of the Bible, and I have found it an absolute revolution. In terms of my my kind of lived experience of being guided by the Word of God, actually, it makes a huge difference. If, as you you face a certain situation or a certain temptation, you, you hear the words of God in your head. You hear Jesus challenge you or encourage you. I think probably if I look back in 10 years' time from now, I'll see it as a massive step change, actually, in my walk with Jesus, that it suddenly dawned on me after 10 years of being a Christian that memorizing the Bible is a good idea. So I would commend it to you this morning. If you've never kind of taken, I don't know, a chapter of the Bible or four or five verses and tried to memorize them, do it. It would be one of the best things you'll do this year, I guarantee you. Memorize the Bible. Read it. Study it. Do whatever you can. Get it into you. Kind of absorb this book. But if you do read the Bible, you'll find that actually this isn't the only way that God guides people. Um, There are all kinds of other ways that God is guiding his people. 
For example, visions. Uh, Look in the Bible, you'll see people like Peter in the book of Acts. Um, when he sees this remarkable vision of a sheep come down, it's got all these animals on it that Jewish people would not typically eat. It's a strange vision, isn't it? But he is guided and directed through this vision, this supernatural experience. Um, Similar to that is dreams. Um, Lots of examples of dreams that happen um, in the New Testament and the Old. Uh, Think of Jacob back at the start of Genesis, and he has this strange dream of a ladder going up and down to heaven with angels up and down uh, it. These dreams and visions do sometimes happen. Other times, God communicates and directs people through angels. Um, particularly start of the Gospel of Luke, you see Mary and Zechariah and the shepherds, they're all spoken to by angels, messengers from God. Now, these things are remarkable. Um, my experience, and I think probably the experience of most of us, is that they're not everyday occurrences. I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture that says that they, they can't happen to us or they wouldn't happen to us today or they stopped kind of dramatically at any point in history. Uh, But I do sense that they're not the common experience of Christians every single day. It's interesting, actually, if you look at world Christianity, you find these things often happen in places where there's very limited access to Bibles or very limited access to other Christians you could talk to. Particularly in in the Muslim world, you see that people are having visions of the risen Lord Jesus way more than you would expect. And quite quickly, they might come to, to find a Bible then, and, and they, they learn about a church, and they get to know him. Uh, but it could begin with a vision. So this does happen. God sometimes directs and guides people in that way, but not all that often. More common, um, if you take my definition of it, uh, is prophecy. And the way I understand prophecy, you can, we did some talks actually on, on 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 a while back. Uh, and I had the, the privilege, or the... Uh, not sure what you call it, of, of uh, talking about uh, prophecy and tongues and those kinds of issues. Uh, prophecy, I understand it, in the broadest sense in the New Testament, is God speaking to Christians through other Christians. Now, in different traditions, um, we'll use different language to frame that. Um, in different places, it will um, we'll have a kind of a more uh, prominent view of prophecy. Other places, it's quite understated. Um, but I would un- understand it in that way, that God speaks to individuals through other individuals. And so as you pray for a friend, maybe together with a friend, you may have a strong sense that God wants to communicate something to that person. Maybe you feel that God is wanting to say something to that person through you. And tentatively, you don't go kind of all Elijah on them and say, thus saith the Lord or whatever and kind of get up on your high horse. But tentatively, with a bit of humility and recognizing that this could be God speaking or it might not be, offer it to them. Say, this is what I think God may be saying to you. Um, often in the context of prayer, that might be the case. And, and God can direct and guide people through prophecy. I think that, that still happens today. It can happen in a more formal sense as well. Um, just last week when I was uh, preaching on the topic of God as Father, um, I didn't realize it, um, but, but two people came up to me afterwards or, or during the course of the week uh, and told me that what I'd said had a very specific, um, made a very specific point to them. No, I hadn't planned for that. I hadn't been particularly holy or extra prayerful during the week in the way that I prepared. But God spoke directly into two people's circumstances in quite a profound way through the things that God had led me to say. I think that can be a form of modern-day prophecy as people preach or sometimes in in a more informal way, person-to-person, chatting, praying together. Another way, and I've put this in the layer quotes because I couldn't quite work out the best wording for it, but a kind of internal prompting. Sometimes God's Spirit will lead us by just the sense that we get. Not, not so much that someone else says to us, I think this is what God is saying, but you just get a sense as you pray about something, as you reflect on Scripture, as you talk with other people, you get a strong sense that God could be guiding you in this direction, uh, that this may be the way for you to go. And then, and then finally, um, through circumstances. Um, often, I think, many of us, these bottom two, it's kind of how we sense in a, in a kind of experiential way God guiding us as we read the Word, as we pray, as we talk with others, We get a sense that a door has opened. We talk about an open door or a shut door, don't we? I think you get that in the book of Acts, in in Acts 16, um, in some sense. Paul is trying to work out where to take his mission next, and he's told that he's stopped by the the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus from entering Asia. And we don't know the details, what stopped them, whether it was bad weather or he missed the boat or something more dramatic than that. It's followed up then by a vision, but in the first instance, it could just be a circumstantial thing. He, he read the circumstances as he prayed and sensed that God was leading him in a different direction. And we can experience that too. Problem is, though, all of this feels a bit subjective, doesn't it? All feels a bit touchy-feely. 
hmm, I, I sense that God is leading me here. I feel as though God is, is directing me in this direction. Do you, do you think the word of the Lord is saying this to you? Is this a, I've got a word of knowledge. It all feels a bit vague. Is there a danger that it's not actually God speaking, but it's just wishful thinking? Or it's my laziness or my self-interest or the kind of voice of my dad, what he would have said. Or it's, it's, it's kind of something more sinister, like a demonic voice or whatever. I mean, people worry about all this kind of stuff. If you get away from the objective word of God, then, then what might happen? This all feels a bit open to abuse, doesn't it? Now, just to say, actually, the way that we handle the scriptures can sometimes be very subjective. And we need to be careful that we don't just impose our own ideas on that. But with all the other stuff that I've said, I think the scriptures are open to that. John, when he writes um, his first letter, 1 John 4, 1, he says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. It realizes that when people are being guided or, or spoken to or directed, there is a real danger, and we need to be open to this, that we're not just being pushed along by something other than the Spirit of God. We can say to ourselves, I'm being led by the Spirit. But are you? And so I think the Bible tells us to be cautious. It tells us to kind of stay critical about these things and keep our antennae up. So so how do we do that? Well, I guess obviously we check whether it fits with what the teaching of the Bible is. I mean, it's a pretty obvious thing to say that the Spirit will only lead within the limits of the Bible, won't it? Of course, we say that, but people often have said, oh, well, I think the, Bi- uh, I think the Holy Spirit is leading me to, to move in with my girlfriend or whatever. Now, the Holy Spirit is never going to tell you to move in with your girlfriend and start sleeping with her. I can tell you that with complete confidence because Scripture would be against that. If the Bible teaches clearly on something, the Holy Spirit's not going to contradict what he has authored in the Bible. Beyond that, and this is just really another way of phrasing, but I liked it, so I wanted to include it here. Does it sound like the voice of Jesus? I think that's a nice way of phrasing it. Jesus, in the book of John, he says that um, his sheep, they recognize his voice. And I think a big part of learning how to follow the shepherd is recognizing his voice. Of course, we do that by immersing ourselves in the Bible. We do that by listening to wise Christians. We do that by praying as much and as often as we can, praying continuously. And we learn to recognize the voice of Jesus. And so really, it's another way of paraphrasing the, the first point. What does, what does the Bible say on this? But, but the Jesus we meet in the Gospels, would he point me in this direction? Would he tell me to do this? Would he encourage me to go in this way? It's a good question to ask yourself. Third thing, this is really important. What do other Christians think? It's no coincidence that we're met here today in a big group of Christians together. I mean, we could, this is going out on little cameras to the internet, you could sit at home and watch this on YouTube, and you could never actually meet any of the people in this room. You could sort of belong, and I say sort of belong, because it wouldn't really mean belonging to this church. You could access the teaching of this church, but never attend the church, never meet with the people in this room. And there's a reason that the church has always met together, because we're meant to talk to each other and support each other and advise each other and encourage each other. And so I'm, I'm 30. There are people here way older, way wiser than me, who've been through a lot more, who have experienced life uh, in ways that I haven't, who, who've walked with God for many more years and decades. And if we're going to test what the spirits are saying or test the way that we are being guided to see if we're being led by the spirit or by something else or just by our own silly ideas, then a good thing to do is to ask someone else. Ask your mum and dad. Ask an elder in the church, ask a youth leader. Ask them whether they think that this sounds like the kind of thing that Jesus would advise you to do. Does it seem wise? Does it seem sensible? Is this a good use of your time or a good use of your money or a good use of your skills? Talk it through with someone who's wiser than you. What do other Christians say? And then finally, if you get kind of positive responses to all those, if it seems like this is what the Bible teaches, if it's in accord with that, if it's the kind of thing you can imagine the Jesus of the Gospels advising you to do, if other Christians think it's a wise and a sensible use of your time or whatever it might be, then push the door. Go for it. See what happens. This week I came across... um, this little website, I forgot what it's called now, but it's a kind of Christian satire sort of thing. They write little news articles that aren't really real, but they kind of poke fun at silly Christian ideas. Uh, And I came across this one. It says, Walter Houston, described by a family member um, as a devoted Christian, died on Monday after waiting 70 years for God to give him a clear direction about what to do with his life. 
He hung around the house and prayed a lot, but just never got that confirmation, his wife Ruby says. Sometimes he thought he heard God's voice, but then he wouldn't be sure, and he'd start the process all over again. Houston, she says, never really figured out what his life was about, but felt content to pray continuously about what he might do for the Lord. Whenever he was about to take action, he would pull back because he didn't want to disappoint God or go against him in any way. Ruby says he was a very sensitive man, sensitive to always remain in God's will. That was primary to him. Friends say, uh, they, uh, sorry, friends say they liked Walter, though he seemed not to capitalize on his talents. Walter had a number of skills he never got around to using. Says longtime friend Timothy Burns, he worked very well with wood and had a storytelling side to him too. I always told him, take a risk, try something new if you're not happy. But he was too afraid to let the Lord down. To his credit, they say, Houston worked mostly as a handyman and was able to pay off the mortgage on the couple's modest home. There you go. It's a sad life, a fictional life, thankfully. But I wonder how many of us are like this chap. We, we go through our life, and after decades and decades and decades, we've been afraid to try anything, afraid to do anything, because we haven't had that confirmation. We haven't heard audibly from God that this is the way to go, this is the thing to do. And so this chap, Walter, who's imagined by the author, he ends up doing nothing. He sits around the house, he prays, he asks God, what shall I do, what shall I do, what shall I do? And it never really comes to anything. I think actually a much more sensible approach is if it fits to the Bible, if people think it's wise, then do it. Go for it, try it, see what happens. It may be that this wasn't God speaking to you in the first place. You may have to change your plans. You may need to take a different route, but see. If it's not sin, if it seems sensible, if Jesus would want you to do it, then give it a go. That seems to be the way that God often will guide us. But all of this I've described so far seems a little bit frustrating, doesn't it? Uh, It can be a little bit slow, a little bit challenging. You read the Bible lots, you pray lots, you talk with other people lots. I I think a lot of us, when it comes to guidance, would be much happier if we had something a bit more like this. Jesus gives you a weekly FaceTime. Okay, imagine this. Beep, 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 beep. Jesus rings you up on a Monday morning. Ah, hi, Dave. How are you doing? Looking good today. Uh, Just a couple of things to say to you because you uh, asked me a few questions. On the job, I know you think you're inexperienced, but in my infinite wisdom, in my divine sovereignty, I'll pull a few strings. You'll get the job. No problems. Um, Also, it's going to rain this afternoon, so pack a spare pair of socks, and I'd go for the red tie over the yellow any day. See you next week. Bye. Okay? Uh, That would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? A little FaceTime with Jesus, he he deals with all your problems, all your questions, you get some nice concrete answers, and then that's it. But I wonder why we'd be attracted to that kind of guidance from Jesus. Would it be because we want the intimacy and the closeness, the relationship of face-to-face conversation? Probably not. I think, actually, the reason we're attracted to this is the complete opposite. It's because we want quick, immediate answers to our questions. When we think about guidance, we assume that God's purpose in all of this is to give us nice, neat answers to the difficult challenges we face. When we think of guidance, we probably think about three or four, maybe four, um, areas of life that God is interested in guiding us in. Love life, of course, that's what everyone thinks of, first of all. Uh, Houses that we should buy or rent or whatever. Jobs and careers and university and that sort of thing. And then maybe if we're feeling super, super duper holy, sort of the area of church I should serve in, or if I've got a bit of spare cash, where should I direct my money kind of in terms of charities and stuff. And that's about it. And if God's purpose in guidance is just to give us answers to those things, then why doesn't he do something a bit more like this? Why doesn't he just quickly give us the answers? Or the kind of more realistic um, equivalent would be a word of knowledge. Someone tells you, this is what you should do. This is the job you should do. This is the house you should buy. Because we realize that the Bible doesn't work like that, does it? And the Bible will not tell you which individual person from your circle of friends you should go on a date with. The Bible will not help you like a kind of magic eight ball to decide which house to buy. You can't sort of hold it up to the screen when you've got right move open and see if it points to this flat or that flat. That's not the way that the Bible works. And so the slower process of reading the Bible and talking to Christian friends and praying and praying and praying seems like a really silly way for God to have set things up in the norm for Christians most of the time. 
But, but what if God's purpose and guidance isn't just to give us neat answers to a few different categories of problem that we might face in life? What if actually God's guidance is much deeper and much wider ranging than that? If actually as God guides us and directs us, what he's really doing is helping us to be better followers of Jesus. He's like the Proverbs passage we read. He's like a father who is teaching us wisdom, who's, who's showing us the way to go in this situation so we understand how to go in another situation. He's challenging us when we sin or when we go off the path that he wants us to be on. He's bringing us back in. I mean, you think of, of what it's like to be a child and to be parented well, or to be a parent and to parent well. You don't just say, here's what you need to do today, tomorrow, and the next day, or whatever. You, you model it to them. You show them how life should be lived. You teach them general principles. You show them by example. You, you, you mold the, the child as best as you can. You mature them. And, and I think that's how God is working with us. He wants us to be better followers of Jesus. He wants us to be in closer relationship with him. And when we reach out for something like this, I think we're reaching out for a, a kind of short-circuiting of that relationship. We just want the answers on, on a sheet of paper or in a quick phone call. And we're not so much interested in building a relationship with that father. We're not so interested in spending time in prayer, in spending time listening to him, in spending time with his people. And it's over that gradual daily, weekly, yearly relationship that we build that closeness. So our approach to God when it comes to guidance often means that we reach for the wrong kind of thing. We're after just a quick word of knowledge that sorts it all out. When in reality, God often speaks to us in different ways, very slowly, very gently, shaping us, molding us, growing his relationship with us. Before we finish, just a couple of points and actually, there are eight subpoints to this point, so I do apologize. It's not like me to have so many points and subpoints and things, but I have today. I don't know what it is about this morning. But anyway, a big question to ask is why do we often miss God's guidance? Why do we often miss what God is saying to us, the way He's directing us, the way He's shaping us? There are a whole bunch of things I could say. I whittled it down to eight, you'll be thankful. Uh, first one is, and this is really important, I missed it, and I heard it this week in a talk, and I thought that's genius. We have an inaccurate view of God. Often the reason that we miss hearing the voice of God is we're listening for the wrong kind of voice. Last week, what kind of God did we talk about? We talked about a God who is a father, a God who loves us, a God who uh, more than any human father has ever had affection for their child has affection for us. And so when we sometimes wrongly listen out for an angry judge, for a frustrated, distant God, we don't hear the voice of a compassionate, caring father. When we imagine what God is like and we get that so wrong, we often miss what God is saying to us because we just couldn't imagine that he would approach us in the way that a father does. Second thing that can happen is that we just don't ask. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock on the door, you open, etc., etc., etc. But actually, that involves asking, doesn't it? So, sometimes we don't make the time. Sometimes we don't ask God. We don't pray, Lord, help me with this situation. Guide me. I, I think how many times I've been frustrated with God because there's been no direction in, in, in where I'm heading. There's been no sense of guidance, but I realize I've never actually asked. That can be a problem. Another one. This is the scourge of my generation, probably the scourge of yours too, I'd imagine. We are too busy and too distracted. I mean, look at your calendar. Um, notice how many times something in your pocket vibrates or something bleeps or there's a screen or there's noise or there's sound or there's people. Uh, we just live in a, in a kind of cacophony of stuff that, that no previous generation has ever, ever experienced. No one has been so connected. No one has been so uh, bombarded with noise and stuff and, and things and information. You just think sort of Netflix constantly. It just keeps on going, doesn't it? If you finish an episode, a new one just starts. And, and, and this, you can't stop it. Well, you can stop it, but most of us don't. And, and so we're just bombarded with stuff. And so the space for God to speak to us, the space to listen to him is just not there. Sometimes we fail to think. We assume that... Uh, in a kind of false piety, to be guided by God would, uh, would miss out our brain, that it wouldn't be uh, logical or sensible or rational, but actually God has given us those faculties. And when we're working through together with others, uh, maybe a tough decision. Maybe we're thinking about how we approach something. Thinking is not sinful. Thinking is good and sensible. 
We're meant to have our minds renewed. We're meant to think in new ways that we haven't thought before we were a Christian, but we're meant to think. Fifthly, uh, we don't take advice. I mean, I've been here before this morning, but I'll just say it again. Take advice. Listen to people. There are older, wiser, more sensible people in this room. They may have faced exactly the same thing as you. Listen to them. Ask their advice. Seek wisdom. This is another one which is a massive problem for people my generation. We don't wait. We have entertainment on demand. We have information on demand. We have food on demand. You can press a button and a deliveroo pops up with like whatever food you want in the back of his funny box on his back. And, and so you have everything at your fingertips in a moment, right? And so to wait for the wisdom of God or to wait for the guidance of God just comes unnaturally. And a lot of us just aren't prepared to wait. Sometimes we have to clear the distractions. Sometimes we have to wait for God. Seventhly, I think we're on, unwilling to suspect ourselves. I mean, this goes back to the subjectivity thing, doesn't it? Is there a chance that when we think we're hearing God, it could be that we're just hearing our own voice in our head. We're hearing our lust or our laziness or our anger or our frustration or our restlessness or our own puffed up view of ourselves talking to us and telling us where we should go or what we should do or how we should spend our time or our money. It's a possibility, isn't there, that we're deluding ourselves. And so sometimes just to have an awareness of that can be very helpful in discerning the voice of God. And then finally, disobedience. It can be that we're not hearing God because we've disobeyed him again and again. I mean, taking the point we made earlier with the FaceTime thing, maybe God isn't speaking to you right now about a big life decision. He's not telling you to marry that person or that person or to do that job or that job or to go to Southampton University or Exeter University or whatever it might be. Perhaps God is just saying to you, you need to have a, a looser grip on your money, you need to be more generous with those who are in need. And if week after week after week you've heard that voice and you've suppressed that voice, it could be that you find it hard to hear the voice of God and the guidance of God because you've been disobedient. I'm not saying it is, but it's a possibility, isn't it? So all of these things combined can make it hard for us sometimes as sinful human beings to hear the voice of God. But we do war with these and we strive to hear what God is saying to us, to be led by the Spirit. Finally, before we finish, have I missed God's best for me? This is a common question that, that I think Christians will sometimes ask, but often we, we won't even vocalize it. We just fear this idea that, that, that God's plan for us is a bit like a tightrope, got kind of balancing along this thing. And uh, if you trip to one side or the other, that's it. You kind of fall, and then God's best for you is up there, and you've missed it, and it's hopeless then. You're kind of, your life is, is ruined. When actually, when we read the scriptures, we see that God's sovereignty doesn't seem to work like that. Two things just to say on this. God is more sovereign than we think. I think sometimes we imagine that if we trip, if we make a little mistake, then God's plan is scuppered. And that's simply not the case. The God who knows the beginning from the end, the God who is in control of every little decision, the one who micromanages the entire universe, is able to incorporate your failings, your weaknesses, your stupidity into his sovereign plan. I mean, I mean take Peter, for example, in the, in the Gospels. He, he fails Jesus dramatically. He denies him and lets him down. But in the sovereignty of God, even that is used in the plan of God. And you can see this again and again in Scripture. So if you feel like you've, you've taken the wrong turning... If you feel like you've, you've made a major mistake, you know it was disobedient, you know that God was leading you this way and you went that way, or you just don't know which way you're going and you feel like now you're in the wrong place, understand that God is more sovereign, more wonderful, more wise, more able to restore your life than you ever believed. And finally, this can come from thinking that life is tough. Um, you experience life and it's not easy, and you think, well, because life is difficult right now, I must be on the wrong track. Because life is hard, uh, or my relationship is struggling, or um, the house that I went after fell through, or the job that I went to isn't working out. I must be disobedient to God. Well, actually, life is a bit more complicated than we think. Take a look at the life of Job, or the life of David, or the life of Jesus. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, and it is because we've been disobedient. But very often we find ourselves in challenging situations 
we find ourselves hard pressed we find things really really tough and it's not because we've been disobedient but because we've been obedient sometimes like Jesus you can do everything that the father has asked you can follow the way that he goes and actually things go tough for you <laughs> in, the, in the short term things are, are difficult for you in the short term but hang in there if the story of Jesus tells us anything it's the faithfulness following the, the way of our father keeping going even when it's tough leads to glory that's what we see in the life of Jesus you look at the, the story of Jesus and then reflect in the book of Hebrews we've been there a few times in this series and Jesus now is the one seated on the throne next to the Father in heaven. That, that's how it pans out. Sometimes in the short term, even obedience can lead to difficulties. But we keep going. We keep trusting. We keep following. We keep listening and trying to hear the voice of God in the cacophony of all the things that are going on around us. We try to be faithful and follow him. Now, we're not going to get it perfect all the time. And that's why it's good to have a gracious, sovereign God who forgives, who loves us, who's there with us, who's a father who wants the very best for us. And when we fall, he picks us up. And when we take the wrong turning, he redirects us until one day we're home with him. I'm going to pray for us now. And the band's going to come up and uh, we're going to sing a song in a moment that picks up some of the themes we've been talking about this morning. Father, thank you so much that you are a God who loves us. You're a God who is in control of everything in this world. Nothing takes you by surprise. Nothing is beyond you. Lord, when you see the challenges that we face, um, none of them is too big for you. And Father, even though we are often out of our depth in this world, uh, you are never out of your depth. And so Lord, we, we rest on you because you are our sovereign God and our Father who loves us. And so please speak to us, uh, even though often we fill our lives with a lot of noise, even though often we don't make time to listen to you, please speak to us. Uh, please help us to be led by the Spirit. Enable us by your Spirit to be more obedient, to uh, listen more attentively, to follow more boldly. We pray that we would be followers of Jesus, uh, that we'd grow as followers of Jesus, that we'd grow as your sons and daughters in relationship with you. Please help us, we pray. Amen.